Good morning to you guys. How are you? Good to be here with you guys. Let's open our Bibles to John chapter 6. And let's pray together. In fact, why don't you pray? Just in your hearts right now, just take a moment. If you haven't taken a moment to pray this morning, let's do that now. Thank you, Lord. Lord, thank you that we can be here. Father, we pray uh, for the persecuted church around the world today that, that meets and uh, has met. And we, we pray for our brothers and sisters that we don't know, but whom, with whom we are connected, Lord, that you'd bless and strengthen those in the Middle East, in, the, in Asia, in Africa, in different places where the, the Christians are persecuted and suffer, Lord. We pray for their strength and their safety. May we here, Lord, in America not become comfortably numb, Lord, to the fact that we are right now protected and can meet freely. May we, may we not become enamored, Father, with the trinkets of this world, Lord, that are passing away. May we not buy into the mindset of the culture that we live in, Lord, but may we have our lives and our hearts set in a path according to your word, according to your heart, and as your spirit would teach us. And we ask that you teach us today, Lord, and have your way with us, God. It's our joy, Lord, to know you and to serve you and to bless your heart and to be touched by you. So you, through your word today, by your spirit, Lord, please teach us. And we ask your blessings on the kids, all the children, all the little guys, all the youth. Bless the teachers and the helpers, Lord. Thank you. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. In John chapter 5, we saw that Jesus healed a man uh, who had been lame 38 years. He was laying at a place called the Pool of Bethesda, and Jesus healed him, and after the healing commanded him to pick up his mat, he had something he was laying on, and uh, to take his mat and go home. And it was the Sabbath day, the holy day for the Jews, and because it was done on the Sabbath, because he was carrying a mat on the Sabbath, the Jewish leadership in Jerusalem accused him of breaking the Sabbath law. In the Ten Commandments, God said to keep the, the Sabbath holy. He told the Jewish people, keep the Sabbath holy, don't do any work on that day. But they extrapolated it out to ridiculous lengths. And uh, in their mind, it was against the law of God to even carry anything. And so they challenged this man and they said, what are you doing carrying a mat? And he said, the man that healed me told me uh, to pick up my mat and go home. And, and they said, who is he? And uh, he didn't know at the time, but he later found out it was Jesus. And later on, the religious r rulers came to Jesus and challenged him. And Jesus revealed to them not only his authority over the Sabbath, but that he claimed to be God. And so from John chapter 5, there's, there's opposition, religious opposition, put in motion against Jesus. It will obviously ultimate in his death. Uh, but we pick up the story here. We don't know how long before chapter 5 and 6, between chapter 5 and 6. Some people say it was a short time. Others say as long as six months were not given that. It's probably a fair amount of time. It wasn't just the next week or anything like that. But uh, John is focusing not on the whole uh, chronological narrative uh, of the life of Jesus, but he's picking out a lot of the high points and the things that really stood out. And so we pick up the story here, well-known story. May the Lord speak to us through it. After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. Then a great multitude followed him because they saw his signs, which he performed on those who were diseased. And Jesus went up on a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was near. So we, we, we see parallel accounts here in, in the other Gospels, and I want to direct your attention, if you would, to the notes here. In the Gospel of Luke, in chapter 9, Luke tells us that Jesus here was, he had sent out his disciples, they had returned from a, from a missionary endeavor. They were trying to find a time to retreat and a time to relax, and that, that kind of is the, 
the backstory to what happens here in John chapter 6. If you look at your notes there, if you would, Luke chapter 9, it says, Then he took them and went privately aside into a deserted place belonging to the city called Bethsaida. But when the multitudes knew it, they followed him, and he received them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed those who had need of healing. When the day began to wear away, the twelve came and said to him, Send the multitude away that they may go into the surrounding towns and country and lodge and get provisions, for we are in a deserted place here. And so kind of the backstory is that Jesus here, fully God but also fully man, was tired. We all get tired physically, we get tired emotionally, psychologically, spiritually. It's good to take a, a time aside to go on a retreat. For instance, the, the married couples, a lot of them next week going on a retreat, getting away, uh, being blessed by friends and, and relatives that can watch the children, that kind of thing, and focusing on their marriage and kind of just getting away from the phone and the hobbies and the chores around the house. You know, I don't know if you're like me, but, you know, you get around the house and you want a day off, but you just, everywhere you look, there's another chore or something that should have been done or could be done, you know. And so it's just nice to get away. And Jesus here is doing that very thing. But his popularity is such and his, his fame has, is growing because of the miracles that he was doing. And so you can't blame the multitudes, the masses, for, for seeking him out. And so though Jesus was seeking a time of rest with his disciples, the masses came to him. And that's what's going on. It's a, it's a normal and understandable response. We see in verse 3, Jesus went up on the mountain, sat there with his disciples. In verse 5, he lifted up his eyes and he saw the multitude coming towards him. And so he anticipates that there's going to be a need. He received the multitudes even though he was tired and recently persecuted. Application. <laughs> it says in the book of Colossians, Christ in you the hope of glory. The, the hope that we have to be in glory is the person of Christ dwelling within us. Spirit of Jesus dwelling within us. That being so, he imparts to, to the Christian his heart, his mind. Not that we have a divine mind, but we have a divinely influenced mind. And so the things that Jesus wants to do, he wants to do through every Christian here, every single one of us. So one of the first takeaways that we have for our time today is that though Jesus faced opposition and though Jesus was physically and I'm sure emotionally, spiritually, mentally tired, he saw that there was a moment when he, when he needed to receive the multitudes and so he did. And so guys, you know, there's, there's I hate the word balance because life isn't always balanced. Life is whatever's right for the moment. And so I never say there's a balance, but I think I just said that there's a balance. But there's really not a balance. <laughs> In fact, the, the Bible, okay, rabbit trail number one. I think I'm going to give myself three today, okay? Rabbit trail number one, the Bible doesn't teach to have a balanced life. The Bible teaches to have a godly life, okay? You can't find a verse in the Bible that says have a, have a balanced life. And people will say, well, I want to have a balanced life. I want to have family and work and this and ministry and everything else. The Bible, you know, that, that sounds really logical and everything. And we don't want to neglect anything that we should be paying attention to. But in the moment, what does God want you to do? I got received a call from a friend the other day that said, can we get together? And I said, no, it's my day off. I need a day off. <laughs> I need my Sabbath every week to try to just regroup and all of that. But there are other times when I'll get a call and it's like, it's my day off, but I'm going. Because of whatever dictates, whatever God would dictate to me for the moment and for you as well. So an encouragement and an application number one, if you want to kind of take notes or mark something in your Bible or something like that, your time belongs to God. And a rousing amen burst forth from the crowd. <laughs> <laughs> Your time belongs to God. No, oh, hey, look at that, okay? There's, there'll be more of those coming, okay? Your time belongs to the Lord. Some, you know, sometimes, yes, it's right to pull back and say, you know, it's not an emergency. Emergencies like are if you're bleeding, then call a paramedic. If the house is on fire, call a firefighter. And, you know, everything else may not be an emergency. But there is a time when we just drop what we're doing no matter what. And even if you're tired, you're burned out, you're emotionally spent and all of that. And you just say, there's a need here. And I believe that God is directing me to this. And this is one of those moments for Jesus. So may we as followers of Jesus, whoever that is here in the room, may we never say, well, it's just, it's just my day off. And I just, I just make it a rule to never do anything on my day off. Your life is subject to the leading of the Spirit of God, not to, to your pre-designed schedule. 
So we need to be ready in season and out of season. Jesus here is ready in season. He's tired. The persecution has started. He's trying to get away. Normal stuff, but the multitudes came and they needed attention, so he received them. We are told here in verse 4 that it was the Passover, which is in the spring, March or April, according to the lunar calendar, it was always a full moon. It was the time that the Passover was celebrated. God's deliverance was remembered as the, as the Jewish people were rescued from the nation of Egypt in their slavery. It also really kind of was a remembrance of Moses being used by God to lead the people out of, out of slavery and then into the wilderness where they were supposed to go directly to the promised land, lack of faith, they, it took them 40 years. But Moses here was used by God and he prayed and, and manna was provided for the people. And so in a wilderness place, bread was provided for the people. And in, and in a way, Moses was typifying and, and pointing forward to Jesus who would also provide bread in a wilderness place. It's, it's suggested by some of the commentators, maybe some people were thinking of that connection. And we're going to see that at the end of, of the passage that we look at today, that some say, oh, you're the prophet that Moses talked about. Because Moses had said in the book of Deuteronomy, God will send you a prophet like me. And so they were looking for similarities, and it, that may have kicked up, which might be the reason that the commentator, that John, inspired by the Spirit of God, put in the text, it was the Passover. That's significant for some reason. I haven't discovered all the reasons yet, but I think that might be one of them. These people also may have been on their way to Jerusalem for the feast. So they're pilgrims. They go three times a year to Jerusalem to celebrate these feasts. Now, that's the setting. Now we see the problem that is existing here with Jesus and his disciples and the people, and we see the solution. Verse 5, Then Jesus lifted up his eyes, and seeing a great multitude coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread that these may eat? But this he said to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Jesus here looked up, and he recognized human need. We are told in the Gospel of Matthew, Sermon on the Mount, words of Jesus. If you follow your notes, Matthew 6, 8, as Jesus spoke to the multitudes, he says, your father knows the things you have need of before you ask him. Now, I hope for all of us, that's a general encouragement, and I would hope even beyond that, for some of us, a specific encouragement for today. There's been times in my life, I mean, I've read, obviously, the Gospel of Matthew many times. Many of us have read the, read the Sermon on the Mount, taught through the Sermon on the Mount, and, and that's always an encouraging verse. But there are times when a verse like that will hit you, and I hope there's somebody today that can receive it that way, that you being reminded that God knows what you need, because you've just been thinking about what you need. And somehow, in the desperation of the moment, we can forget that God knows what we need. He knows what we need provisionally. He knows what we need emotionally. He knows what we need psychologically. He knows what we need spiritually. He knows what kind of encouragement we need or, or think we need or anything at all. Whatever you really need, God already knows ahead of time before you ask. It's right to ask him anyway. But he knows, guys. He knows what you need. And that should be a great source of relief and blessing. He knows what you need. Even before you ask, Jesus repeated it again in case the people missed it the first time. <laughs> Matthew 6, 31. Therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? May I fill in some other paraphrases there? How can I forgive them? How will I find a job? How will I explain this? How can I have my heart softened again? How will I ever be friends with that person? How can I get my marriage back? How can I apologize to my children? How could I ever forgive that person? All of those things, he knows what you need. And we can work ourselves into an ulcer or whatever else worrying about things. Now, it's, I, I never get on people's case when they're worrying. I, when, when Christians come to me and say, I'm, I just feel so bad, I'm just worrying, it's like you're human. For goodness sakes, you're human. Not defending worrying, because Jesus said not to, but it's very understandable, isn't it, guys? It's very understandable that we worry about things. Not a person in the room doesn't worry about something. So may we encourage one another and just turn one another's focus and heart and mindset back, back to what Jesus has said and not kind of be down on each other about those things. 
Maybe if there's somebody that's a, a consistent worrier, maybe they need a little, little bit of an admonition or something like that. But let's remind each other that God knows. Look what Jesus said. Don't worry, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? After these things, the Gentiles seek, those who don't know God. Your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. There it is again. He knows that you need these things. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. There's where we need to put our energy. And there's where we need to put our focus in seeking first the kingdom of God. Do not worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. So back to the point, Jesus knew what these people needed. He knew that there was a need. And so he, he, he uh, asked Philip, where shall we buy bread that these may eat? How can, what can we do to help them? Now we read in Luke that the disciples also recognized they have a need. So with one hand, I pat the disciples on the back. Good, you're paying attention. With the other hand, I poke them in the ribs and saying, you had a bad solution. <laughs> you had a couple of bad solutions. But on this hand, at least, they noticed. They noticed. I hope and pray, application number two, take away. I hope your eyes are open to the people around you. I hope you keep an extra $10 in your wallet or purse to give to a homeless person that you see regularly. I know where to find certain people. Do you? Do you know around town? If you go, you know somebody's going to be standing there. And have you taken time to strike up a conversation? Do you know that God loves poor people? Do you know that God loves the homeless people? The destitute people? He loves them and he cares about them. He told the nation of Israel, don't completely glean your field. Don't completely harvest all the grapes so that the, the poor people, the homeless people can walk through your field, not so they can bring a basket, but at least they can stand there and eat and God wants to take care of them. God cares about people that have needs. If you have the mind of Christ, and if you're yielding and influenced by the mind of Christ, do you notice people in Napa that need help? I hope you do. If you don't, I'm going to poke your eyes out. <laughs> Teasing. I just throw those things in there so you'll take a deep breath and get reoxygenated and laugh a little bit and kind of just stay with me. We need to be paying attention to our community. If, you, if you're not comfortable giving money away, I understand that. Do you have food coupons to Safeway in your pocket, in your purse, in your car? Do you have a gas card in your car that you could give to somebody? Are you ready to help somebody? Let me ask this. Are, are you even paying attention? We need to pay attention. Jesus paid attention. He said God the Father pays attention. He knows what people need. So may we be, of all people, some of the most generous people in the county of Napa. Amen? It's not the government's job. It's the church's job. Okay? We are here to help alleviate personal suffering, to point people to Jesus for salvation, the most important thing, but also to alleviate personal suffering as we are able. Not beyond what we're able, but as we are able. So may we be people that are paying attention to it. Jesus paid attention to it. God the Father pays attention to it. The disciples, to their credit, also paid attention. They didn't have the great solution, but at least they were paying attention. It says here, and they, yeah, they said, just send them away. <laughs> Let's just get rid of the problem, you know, which sometimes we want to do. That's what Luke tells us. Verse 6, he said this to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Jesus was testing his disciples. Now, the word test in the Greek means to test for the purpose of ascertaining what kind of quality something is made of. It's not to tempt somebody to fail, which is what Satan does. When Satan tests a Christian or a person, it's to get them to fail. When God tests us, it's to prove to us what our faith is actually made of. We actually get to see how much faith we have or what may be lacking in our lives. And so Jesus here was testing them to discover what kind of faith and how deep a faith they had. I thought about some other people's faith in the Bible. God promised Abraham in the book of Genesis that he was going to be the father of many nations. And then he miraculously, he and his wife had, had a son named Isaac. And when Isaac was grown up, he said, now, Abraham, I want you to take your son, your only son. I want you to take him up to Mount Moriah. And there I want you to sacrifice him to me. Now, lest this sound barbaric, culturally, this was something that was not 
uh, unknown about. Many times families would take their firstborn and sacrifice them to their pagan gods. And so culturally, this is like, well, I didn't expect this from Jehovah, but this is what he's saying to do, so that's what we're going to do. So you probably know the story. Abraham, uh, Isaac, Isaac takes a bundle of wood. He's a picture of Jesus Christ carrying the cross, going up to Mount Moriah. The son is going to be sacrificed. Uh, at the last minute, Abraham raises the knife. At the last minute, God intervenes and says, no, uh, you know, I wanted to know what was in your heart. We see here, uh, well, I didn't, I didn't list the, the, the scripture, excuse me, but God said, no, Abraham, long story short, I was testing you to see what was in your heart. In the book of Job, Satan asked God permission to afflict Job. And God was bragging on Job. Have you seen any more righteous man in all of the earth? And Satan said, yeah, well, let me, let me get to him and he'll curse you to your face. And God said, you can afflict him, you can afflict what he has, but you can't kill him. And Job suffered many losses, went through much physical pain. But look what he said, Job 23, verses 8 to 10. And, and he's, he's lamenting the fact that he can't connect with God during this time of trial. He knows God is there, but he feels like God is far away. That's pretty relatable, isn't it? When we're in a trial, when we don't know what's going on, God, where are you, is what we often say. Job said, look, I go forward, but he's not there, and backward, but I cannot perceive him. When he works on the left hand, I can't behold him. When he turns to the right hand, I cannot see him. But he knows the way that I take. When he has tested me, I shall come forth as gold. So Job recognized that he was being tested and that when he would come through this trial and his friends were saying, Job, you're suffering because you have some secret sin in your life. And Job is basically saying, look, I don't know what God is doing here. I'm blind to what he's doing. But when, it comes, when I come down to it and he reviews my life, you'll see that I wasn't guilty. When he tests me to show the quality of my life, you'll see that I'm not guilty as you say. And so Jesus here doing the same thing. And I don't doubt but that he does the same thing in our lives today. And it's not as though God doesn't know what our faith is made of or how deep or how strong it is. It's more like we discover what is lacking or conversely, on a positive side, we discover what's there. I, I take great delight. <clears throat> this is going to sound really hideous. <laughs> Maybe. I take great delight in, in, in talking with Christians that are really struggling when they come to me. And they're lamenting the fact that they're struggling. Now, I don't take delight in that they're struggling. I take delight in the fact that they're so concerned that they're struggling. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just saying, praise God, you haven't walked away from the Lord. Other people that I know that have been less of a struggle than you have walked away for lesser reasons. Look at you, you're battling, you're fighting. It says in the book of Hebrews, without faith, it's impossible to please God. I know, but if I was really a Christian, I just wouldn't be worrying. Oh, really? I guess I'm not a Christian either then. <laughs> well, why, I said, then why did you come here today? Well, just, I don't know. I just want to do what's right. So in faith, yeah, God is pleased. <laughs> so we all, we just beat ourselves up sometimes, don't we? Because I shouldn't worry. If I had more faith, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have made that phone call or I wouldn't have said that remark or I wouldn't have, you know. If you were perfect, you wouldn't have done those things. Guess what? You're not. <laughs> But what a blessing it is for me to be able to say, yeah, I know you're fighting and I know you wish you could do better and yeah, I wish I could do better too, but isn't it wonderful that we're even having this conversation because you still have faith in God and you're still believing, even though like Job, you can't see what he's doing and you don't know what's going on, but you're sure that when you come through it, it's going to come out okay. And it feels like when we're going through it, it's never going to end, doesn't it? It's, it just feels like it's never going to end. And then when it ends, it's like, wow, it's over. I can't even believe it. And so the, the disciples here are getting tested. They're in a trial. They're in a dilemma. We have a problem. There's all these people. Number one, we had hoped to have a little retreat and, and kick back a while, and then these people spoiled it. Ministry would be great if it wasn't for the people. <laughs> Church would be great if it wasn't for those people, you know. Life would be great if it wasn't for those people. Well, that's how it is. That's, there's people. And they have needs. And sometimes they come at the worst time. 
And then they come and they have needs that we don't feel that we can meet them. And suddenly we're just, we have this, this, this conviction or this sense of burden like, well, we got to do something. Pat the disciples on the back for that. We've got to do something. Something needs to be done. Oh, I don't know. Let's just send them home. Now, Jesus said, no, we're not going to send them home. Let's buy bread. Where can we get bread? But he was testing them. He knew what was in their hearts, but now they're going to know what's in their hearts. And they're going to grow through this, and they're going to be better men. The disciples' short-sightedness. Look at verse 7. Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them that every one of them may have a little. Now, Philip must have been an accounting major. <laughs> because it says here that there were 5,000 men, and they believed that there was probably women and children. It may have been as many as 10,000 people. So he surveys the crowd, and, and a denarii was, was a day's wage for a common laborer. So it's 200 days' pay for a construction worker. And if you had that much money, it's not going to be enough money to feed them all. How did he get that so quickly? That's a gift of mathematics right there, okay? <laughs> I, would, I would write a song about it, okay? <laughs> how, sad, how sad is this day, you know? Please, please go away. Or so, I don't know. I'd write a blues song about it or something, right? But he comes up with this thing really, really quickly. And on the one hand, look, wow, that's really, really impressive, Philip. But you haven't done a thing to try to solve the problem. You've just analyzed it really well. Is it important to analyze things? Sure. Sure it is. Is God against human logic? No, I don't think so. I don't think God's against human logic. But he gives a hypothetical response, and it's really not solving the problem. It's just explaining why nothing can be done. And so that's his default setting. I have to think Philip is probably a practical you know, pragmatic kind of guy, it, it analyzes everything, this is why it's not going to work, and he just comes to this conclusion. He also says, kind of revealing, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them that every one of them may have a little. So he's just thinking about the bare minimum. And we're going to see here that Jesus goes way over the bare minimum. But he's, he's just, he's kind of minimizing the possibility here of what could happen, and he's just thinking according to his own resources. Verse 8 and 9, verses 8 and 9, look there. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish, but what are they among so many? In my mind, Andrew has done a little bit more. At least he's looked around. He started to look. Philip is just, you ever see that TV show Numbers? The guy's just writing on the glass board. And just, you know, that's Philip, okay? Andrew is the guy, he starts, well, what do we have? What do we, he's made perhaps a little more practical. Maybe he was sarcastic. I don't know. Well, we just got five thousand team. I don't know. But it seems like he did a little bit more, but he still has a short-sightedness about what's going to happen. By the way, barley was considered poor man's food, often used just for horses. And so this is a poor group of people. They need help. Verse 9, there is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish, but what are they among so many? Then Jesus said, make the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in number about 5,000. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to the disciples and the disciples to those sitting down, and likewise of the fish, as much as they wanted. So when they were filled, translated glutted, he said to his disciples, gather up the fragments that, that remain so that nothing is lost. Therefore, they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves, which were left over by those who had eaten. Then those men, when they had seen the sign that Jesus did, said, this is truly the prophet who has come into the world. Okay, fantastic ending. Jesus is testing them, but Jesus doesn't need them. He wants to bring them along. Jesus isn't dependent on them to get the job done, but he wants them to be part of the process because he wants them to grow, and he wants them to be men of faith, and he wants them to be men of vision. So he lets them struggle for a little while. Guys, it's okay if God lets you struggle for a little while. I'm trying to think of some incredible example here, but I can't. What did I just fix recently at the house? Anything? 
Oh, I know what it was. It was a toilet. Priorities, right? And I took the toilet apart in such a way that I actually took off too many pieces. In fact, there was nothing left except the, the porcelain. <laughs> and then I'm like, and then I bought this piece. My wife and I, my dear loving wife, Debbie, she's very practical and logical. I'm the big dreamer, visionary guy. So if a $12 part will fix it, a $70 part's much better. So I have my Home Depot credit card, so I go down there, and, I was, you know, and then I get this thing home, and I'm like, what have I done? <laughs> you know? And I'm, but we've got to have a toilet. <laughs> kind, of, kind, of the, kind of being wedged in and cornered into the moment, it's like, and, and I, how many guys hate reading directions? Come on, stand with me, man. Raise your, be proud, be proud. I, I, <laughs> and the rest of you are not telling the truth. I just don't like reading... But I had, to, I had to like, okay, concentrate, get coffee, whatever you have to do, get a Red Bull, concentrate, focus, focus, ah, focus, you know, and I fix it, and it's amazing. It has, it has low flush, it has high flush, uh, no, hold your applause, hold your applause. But I remember, my, I, I just had this, this kind of like, oh, I, I can't fix this, this isn't, because I, I used to be a plumber like 35 years ago, but things have changed in toiletry, you know, they just, they're not the same. But the moment kind of forced me into this corner where I had to kind of push through. And it's just a funny story to illustrate a point. You get forced into a moment and you have to push through. What if you get forced into a moment of faith when you see there's a need, you have a burden, and you can't do anything about it? Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's financial. Maybe it's family. Whatever it is. Maybe it's your job. Maybe it's your kids. If you have teenagers, <laughs> you're in the moment, probably. It's, not, or it's coming soon. You're, 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 you're squeezed into this thing. And Jesus is like letting you see what's in your heart. And are you going to push through it? And yeah, he could fix the job and he could fix the family member and he could fix all those things. But guys, the, the, the thing that's really needed here is that we grow through these things. Remember in Matthew chapter 17 when Jesus went on the Mount of Transfiguration and he comes down with uh, Peter, James, and John and the other disciples are there. They didn't go up on the mountain. And there's a crowd there. Do you remember what's happening? There's a man there and his son is demon-possessed and the boy is flip-flopping on the ground and foaming at the mouth and Jesus, and they come to Jesus and they said, can, can you please cast out the demon? I talked to your other nine disciples and they couldn't do it. You know, and they're probably standing like, oh, oh, you know. And Jesus starts interviewing the dad. How long has he been this way? And, I, you know, it's been, it's been suggested that the dad is saying, why are we talking about heal him? The boy's flopping on the ground. There's a crowd gathering. Heal him. And, and the man said that the, the demon takes him, throws him in the fire, tries to kill him and destroy him, and, and Jesus heals. But he says, it, he says to the man, if you believe, all things are possible. And the man says, I do believe. Help my unbelief. If my child was demon-possessed and a crowd was gathering to gawk at him or her, I would, I would be saying, geez, you better heal him fast. This is embarrassing. I'm embarrassed for my son. I'm embarrassed for my family. What are people going to say? My son's suffering. But I remember a, a teacher of mine saying, look, Jesus did, just didn't want to heal the guy. He wanted to send him home with a believing father. Jesus isn't just interested in just feeding the people. He didn't need the disciples to feed the people. He needed the disciples to carry on the work. He needed them to be wedged into a corner to feel the, the, the lack of their own resources, to exhaust their own resources, and then turn to him and watch him do his work. Guys, that's what's most important here. Don't, may we not be Christians that are praying that God just do something. Well... He's waiting for us to pray and have faith and to respond so that he can do something. Think for a moment, guys. Think for a moment. What is one of your biggest concerns here in your life? One of the biggest concerns of your life? Just privately in your own. What's the thing that just, that maybe you don't even want to tell anybody about? Or the thing you just share with your spouse or just one or two friends? A big deal in your life. And you're praying, God, just do something, or nothing's going to happen, or it's never going to change. But maybe he's, maybe he's waiting for you to press into prayer more. Or maybe he's waiting for you to take a step of faith. 
to go forgive that person that you just anticipate is going to rip your face off when you try to forgive them. Or go apologize to your boss, even though he made the greater error. Or, or whatever, whatever step of faith you have to do. And so for us to be kind of backed into a corner spiritually, it can be a very good thing. Don't, don't think that's a waste. Nothing's wasted. Jesus didn't need these guys to do his work. He could have created a banquet out of nothing. He could have created the tables, the linen, the silverware, everything. He could have created waiters and waitresses to wait on the, on the 5,000 plus people. He, he didn't need them, but he's including them. Look at your notes here. It's about training them to not lean on their own understanding. You guys know this verse, but it just keeps coming around to us, doesn't it? Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. Whatever that hard thing is in your life. Excuse me. I'm going to trust you, Lord, and I, and I pray you're going to lead me, and you might even lead me in a way that seems really weird to me or very hard to me or almost impossible to carry through. But I want to trust you, and I want you to lead me. Philip here asked Jesus, what difference are a few fish and, a loaves, and loaves going to make? Apparently, it's going to make a lot of difference because Jesus here is co-laboring, and the, and the disciples are co-laboring with Jesus. So a few fish and a few loaves did make a difference. What's the application? You're thinking, I'll never be able to reconcile with that person. I've sent them a couple of cards. They won't respond. But get up every day and pray for them. And then when you run into them in Target, you won't suddenly think, I think I have a flat tire. I better go check on my car. You'll say, how are you? I've been praying for you. And you're thinking, what's that going to do? You don't, you don't know that that might be the tipping point for the healing of a relationship, right? You don't know what an apology might do. You don't know what one more application or one more redoing of your resume might do. You just don't know what's going to happen. You don't know when something is going to change. And it may seem like a small thing. But here the fish and the loaves were necessary. Look at verse 10. I love this. Jesus said, make the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in number about 5,000. In faith, the disciples did what Jesus said. This is, their greatest, this is their greatest sign of faith in this whole thing. What did they not do? They didn't say, well, we'll have them sit down if you explain to us what you're going to do. <laughs> How are you going to do this? And Jesus didn't say, okay, guys, huddle up. This is what I'm going to do. He didn't give them all the details. He just said, I want you to sit them down in groups of 50, and the guys did it. And this is their great act of, act of faith here. This is their great display of faith. This was a key thing. Many times with us, we want all the details before we can feel like we can obey. I'll tell you a story. Um, most of you know the story already, but if you're new to the church, our church bought land in, in Mexico, about 1,000 miles away from here, uh, 500 miles down in Baja Peninsula. We bought three and a half acres about 10 years ago. We felt like God wanted us to. I took the leaders, the board. We went down to Mexico, showed them the land. We believed that God was leading us there. <clears throat> and we sat in a little hotel room. I remember it very well. And we talked about it. And, and the conversation was like this. Well, we're going to buy the land, but then what are we going to do with it? We don't know. Hopefully, we'll build, we'll build a property. We'll build a building and have us plant a church. Well, how are we going to do that? Well, hopefully some other churches will come along and help us. How, well, how do we know? Well, we don't. But we think, we, we think that God wants us to buy this property. And we bought the property, and the Lord added and did it. And I'm really blessed by the guys that I get to work with. We didn't, pardon me? Okay, I agree. God is with us. We had, we had a holy hunch that God wanted us to do something, and we didn't have the details, and we certainly didn't have the resources. But other people, we kind of, the Lord used us to kind of cast a vision for this thing, and other people believed in that, and they said, we want to help, and now we have two buildings, and in the process of building a third. And there's a planted church, and there's a lot of people going, and it's been going for 10 years, and it's a, it's a hub for that, for that area. 
We're starting Life Church. We're starting Life Groups. We're going to start that in January. That's another step of faith. We believe God wanted to do it. How's it all going to work out? Hopefully really well. How, when will we know? After we do it a while. <laughs> we believe that God is leading us. All these, are, is everybody going to like it? Well, probably not. Well, what are we going to do? I don't know. We believe this is what God is doing. We believe this is how God is leading. So we're going to just do the best. Well, who's going to lead? I don't know. We're going to pray and we're going to talk to some people. Well, a lot of questions. I don't know. We just think that this is what God wants to do, so we're going to go forward with it. And whatever's going on in your life or whatever is current in your life, God doesn't always, he doesn't owe us any details, does he? Sometimes he'll just ask us to go do something. Go call this person. Go visit that person. Don't spend that money. Spend that money. Keep that money. Give that money. Whatever the case may be. And Jesus here doesn't give the guys details. He just says, I just, I, this is what I want you to do. And they do it, and it's great. Look at your notes here. Great, note by, great quote by a guy named J.D. Jones. Duty is not measured by ability, and ability is not measured by the sum total of our resources. These guys saw their duty as being able to be carried through or not carried through according to their ability and according to their resources. And Jesus just kind of set that whole thing aside and says, I have, I have something I want you to do. I want you to sit the people down. And what, what, what might the disciples have said? What if they ask us what we're doing? I don't know. He didn't tell us to say anything. Well, what's the plan? Why are we sitting down in 50s? Why not 60s or 40s? We should form a committee. And vote on this. Yeah. They, they, just, they just did it. They didn't have all the details, but Jesus had a plan. Look at verse 11. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, to, he distributed them to the disciples, and the disciples to those sitting down, and likewise of the fish, as much as they wanted. Jesus took those few resources and met human need, and the people were full. And at this point, I really give the disciples a pat on the back because... When Jesus said, would you, would you guys go seat them down in, in groups of 50? And that took some time. There's 5,000 men and, and women and children. That took some time. And, and, and one of those disciples could have just slipped off and said, I feel really stupid. I'm just going to go for a walk and get lost out there. I, I don't, I don't, people are asking me, what are we doing? Where's the food? Where, how we, I mean, there, there's so much that's unexplained, right? And they could have just kind of drifted away and not been involved in it because they just didn't know what they felt uncomfortable with it or whatever Jesus but they didn't and Jesus is doing this thing and these guys got to be a part of it guys the people probably knew where the food came from but who was really in on it starts with a d ends with an i disciples the disciples were in on it the disciples were the guys who were mostly challenged the people were just hungry the disciples were challenged and they didn't bail on it they ran out of their resources and they had some doubt, but they didn't bail on it and they went through the process and they're the ones that saw the miracle the most. And when we get involved with what the Lord is doing, when we don't have resources or we don't know how it's going to work out or so on and so forth, if we'll just follow the Lord, if we'll lean not on our own understanding in all your ways acknowledge him, he'll direct your path. We get to see him do this thing and we have a testimony, right? Anybody? Right? We have a testimony. We, we were able to say, you know what? God is good. He's faithful. He did this thing. He healed my marriage. I got a job. He helped me through this awkward relationship with my children or with my parents or whatever the case may be. And so they obeyed and they got to enjoy the blessing, not only of the food, but of going, wow, that was amazing. Verse 12 and 13. So when they were filled, the baskets were filled. He said to his disciples, gather up the fragments that remain so that nothing is lost. Therefore, they gathered them up, filled the 12 baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves, which are left over by those who had eaten. Quick, quick comment. Jesus was generous, but he's not wasteful. And so that food was saved and I'm sure redistributed or perhaps taken into town, whatever the case may be. Now look at verse 14, another great thing that happens as a result, which they didn't anticipate, I'm sure. Then those men, when they had seen the sign that Jesus did, said, this is truly the prophet who is to come into the world. The disciples went from saying, there's a problem, let's get rid of the problem. They analyzed the problem, but they said, we don't have a solution. Therefore, let's just get rid of the problem. They went from that to being men that trusted without having all the information to following through with the process. What was the result? The people were full of bread and fish, but also what? They started really recognizing Jesus. It's a great thing to share your faith you know, some people go out in the streets with signs and tracks. Fantastic. Some people are, are, are 
less obvious and just talking to friends or people hey, your, the people that do your hair or your doctor or your dentist. You can't talk to your dentist much when you <laughs> Lord loves you, you know, kind of. But, you know, we, we just, we talk, you know, and all of that, you know, and, and that's all good evangelizing and people go witnessing and there's concerts and there's events and crusades and all that kind of thing. But, you know, another way that pe gets people attention about Jesus is the way you go through the processes of trials. And I've heard it time and time and time again, that you live a holy, godly life, and people are, they notice, and they go, what's different about that person? I know people that are in this church because they watched another Christian, and they said, there's something different, and I, and I want that. And I know people that have gotten saved and committed their lives to Jesus and are serving at this church because they watched another Christian just go through life. And in verse 14 here, they're starting to connect, I believe, they're starting to connect Jesus with that prophet that Moses talked about. Look at, look at the bottom of your notes here. Let's close this thing up. If you have any questions, try to answer them. Applications. These are all the takeaways, guys. I pray that may the Lord be speaking to you about any of these. The disciples, number one, did well to notice that the masses were in need. They were aware of their surroundings. May we be people that are noticing our surroundings. I, I really want to encourage you and exhort you, you know, next time you go shopping, even a $5 gift certificate at Safeways or even a fast food place or something so that you can hand something to somebody and just say, God loves you. You know, if it's a food, you know, if it's a fast food thing, they're not going to go spend it on, on alcohol or anything else. And, you know, let's have our eyes open in our community. Number two, the disciples immediately defaulted to human logic when dealing with human need. God is not against human logic, but his power transcends human logic. The disciples only considered their inability to meet human need. That's as far as they went. They were short-sighted at this point. They would go on to not be short-sighted. In the book of Acts, they would be the ones God would use to do the miracles. They would grow in that, but for a while, they were short-sighted. Number three, Jesus tested their faith. They would soon understand their natural default, but they would grow in faith. We all have a natural default setting. There's a problem, and we just kind of do the natural thing. God wants to do the supernatural thing. Number four, Jesus commanded them to do something without giving them an explanation. He doesn't owe us an explanation. He is Lord, right? Jesus is Lord. And so if you believe he's leading you to do something... Just follow through. Even if you don't know how it's going to work out, follow through. Number five, fortunately, the disciples obeyed and the need of the masses was met and there were blessings left over. They, they were shaky, but they obeyed. They followed through and six, seven, eight, ten thousand 10,000 people were blessed. That's amazing. That's amazing, isn't it? That's one, one seventh or one eighth of the population of Napa was blessed by Jesus and 12 guys. That's incredible. I mean, think about that. One seventh, one eighth of the, of the population of Napa was blessed because these guys said, I don't know what he's doing, but I'm going to obey him. That's an amazing thing. Number six, their obedience helped provide the scenario for Jesus to do this miracle. They were contributors. They weren't the source, but they were contributors. How many times God heals a family just because one person said one more time, I'm sorry, please forgive me, I accept responsibility for this. And the miracle broke through, not necessarily a supernatural miracle, but God's work broke through because somebody went along with the process one more time. Number seven, their obedience accomplished a greater benefit. The masses had a high opinion of Jesus. So I like these guys. <laughs> yeah. I like these guys. I totally relate to these guys. And, and I, have, I have my Andrew and Philip moments, you know, and we all do. You know, one of the prayers that we pray uh, here, you know, when sometimes the worship team or you guys when you're going out and doing something, you know, one of the, one of the prayers we pray is, Lord, take our fish and loaves and multiply them. And we just don't know we don't know what one song is going to do. We don't know what one word in a sermon is going to do. You don't know what one person saying hello to you is going to do. Uh, I chatted with somebody last night, and, and uh, 
this is going to sound like I'm patting myself on my back. I don't mean to, but it's just fresh in my mind. And they said, that thing that you said to me, I've known you 20 years, and I've never heard you talk like that, and I can't even believe it. Thank you so much. And I didn't go in premeditating. I'm going to be amazing today. You know, I, I, I just shared honestly with somebody what God was doing in my life, and it, and it just it was revolutionary for them. And I'm just thinking, fantastic. We just never know what one, a few fish and a few loaves are going to do. We just say, Lord, here's all I have. Here's all I am. I don't know how you're going to do this, but I think you just want me to hand this over. So do we have any questions? Do you have an update on how the church's people in South Baja are recovering? I do. Thank you for that reminder. I, I had intended to go because of family responsibilities. I could not go. I wanted to report to you guys that on the Sunday that we uh, received an offering from you guys, we had $4,700 come in. Praise the Lord. Previous to that, we had already sent down 1500 out of our missions account. So we were able to send down about $6,200 plus another $900 from our friends in Canada. Almost 7000 bucks went down there. So Victor just got back. The team that I was supposed to go with just got back. I'm waiting to hear a report. We'll have some pictures and all that. But it was a very fruitful uh, trip. So thank you for those who gave. Thank you for that. Rabbit trail, I know. That's OK. But I've always wondered, is there any meaning to the 12 baskets and the five loaves left over? I don't think so. But you know, I don't know. And it, it, it means there were 12 baskets and <laughs> five loaves. <laughs> it certainly means this, that Jesus did more than they needed. It definitely means that. Is there, is there numerical significance? Maybe not. But is there just a, a logical significance? Yeah, Jesus does more than we need. Yeah, let's stand together. If you need prayer, we're here. Maybe you coming down for prayer is like telling people to sit down in groups of 50. <laughs> You just don't think it'll make any difference. But you guys, I want to encourage you. You know, we all, we're praying now during all of our worship services. You have no idea but that a word of prophecy might be spoken over you that will change your life forever. You have no idea. Oh, it's just those people, and I know those people, and I, I just, you know, I don't want to go. Ball. If God prompts you even for prayer, you have no idea what God wants to do with a few fish and loaves in a prayer. <laughs> and so may we be people that just obey the Lord. Father, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for our salvation. Thank you for the life we have in Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that you use people, that you teach us, that you change us. Lord, would you please help us to have our eyes open to this community, to see the needs physical, and spiritual and emotional and help us to be people that meet needs and to be the conduits through whom you use, Lord, and, and, and send your power through to meet needs. And so, Lord, may our eyes be on you, not on ourselves. We pray you'd use us to your glory, Lord, and may people have an increasingly wonderfully high and holy opinion of you. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Bless you guys. Have a great day.